Welcome once again to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name Podcast with the Legendino. We've got a special guest with us this time around, Legendino. We certainly have, yeah. What a joy and an honour to welcome back. He's getting time off the farm. Please, step on down, Mr. Pete Hilton. <laughs> What an introduction. It's getting better all the time. No, he did that the last time you were on, Pete. The same joke. Yeah. 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 I'm like, oh, my yeah. goodness. But the, 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 delivery, <laughs> the delivery is getting better all the time, just like Sergeant Pepper. And, Pete, Where what a game we've got to talk about today. Yeah. All the yeah. way back to the start of May 1974, the oh, FA yeah. Cup final. And the FA Cup final used to stop the nation back then. Yeah. Liverpool and Newcastle. And I think it's such an interesting game from two almost opposite ends. Because on the one hand, it's the end. It's the end of Shankly. It's the end of the man who built Liverpool, who picked Liverpool up when they were probably the second team in your city. That's right. Yeah. But it's also, I think, the start of the great Liverpool. The Liverpool that have assimilated, because it's only a few months before that season, that they've lost to Red Star Belgrade in the, in the European Cup. And it's almost like they go on full Edwin Collins and orange juice. Rip it up and start again. Because they've realised that what they've been doing, which has got them English champions, ain't good enough. That's and right, so yeah. that there's, there's a redesign. And it's, it's, it's amazing that we're talking about this just after the death of the great Ron Yates. Because yeah. that type of centre-back, they don't want no more. You know, no, they'd had Larry right. Lloyd as a kind of yeah. big Ron Yates. Hey, take a voyage around Ron Yates. You know, yeah, but yeah. What, what they're doing now, and you can see it's one of the reasons that they, they absolutely smash Newcastle in this game. Mm. They've got two yeah. centre-backs who are footballers. In this yeah. case, it's Emlyn Hughes and, and, a, and a very young Phil Thompson. And yeah. it's this that sets them on that incredible run where, you know, for the next 15, more than 15 years, you know, Forest win the title once, Villa win the title once. There's that, that 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 years of Everton, you know, Everton win it twice. But really, it's just like total Liverpool domination. And I think it starts from this game, from the way that they've assimilated the lessons of, of losing to Red Star. You've got to have 11 footballers on the field. You can manipulate the ball much better. So it's the end of the Shankly era and the start of the great Liverpool era. So there's so much for you to wax lyrical about on this one. Yeah, you, you, you're completely right. And I think the pivotal moment is that Red Star Belgrade um, match was Anfield. The beat us away, but then we thought, well, you know, and Anfield, Shankly was expecting, you know, the cops to get behind. We, but they gave a masterclass in total football. And they just played Liverpool off the park. And um, uh, when I was researching the Boot Room Boys book, um, they said that the next day they had like a, a summit and said, we can't play like this in Europe. We've got to adopt a continental style of football. So that was November 73. By May 74, you've seen it on display at Wembley. Mm. It was transformational. And no one had seen anything like it. You know, Coleman was waxing lyrical about it, wasn't he? He was coming out with their brilliant statements when the goals mm. were flying in, mm. which we can talk about later. But, yeah, I think that was the moment when... Uh, the boot room and Shankly decided we've got to play differently here. We've got to uh, adopt a different style of football, playing control football from the back, a lot slower than you're probably used to. Because you remember it used to be Toshak Keegan 1 0, you know, it was the high ball, high centres to Toshak's head. But the, this was a way we have to play on the floor and we have to build up from the back. And it was that the match itself, it was the first time I'd ever been to Wembley. So I was in awe of going to Wembley, uh, but it was one of those games. It was total football, you know. And we we learned to love that, obviously, with the Dutch later on in the year. But we'd never seen anything like it, you know. Mm. We even had Tommy Smith at right back flicking the ball, and um, you know, with the setups of the, some of the goals, mm. and it was all one touch football, and people were amazed by the performance. You know, was there any resistance to it? Um, because I, what, 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 if I had a time machine, I'd like to go back and watch the Tottenham push and run side from fifty fifty one that were a little bit like a little bit like that. Uh, and there, but there was a lot of resistance to it. It was seen as namby pamby and non English. And Wal yeah. Walter Winterbottom, who was the England manager at the time, he said he, he used to get letters from people saying, "Don't pick none of that lot. No, we just get it in there." 
You know, was there any resistance on the terraces yeah, to this change I, of direction? I was only, you know, I was only a youngster on the terraces, but so you know, I wasn't, um, you know, I wasn't aware of it. Uh, but you know, when we were at school, we all started to want to play like you know the way Liverpool played in the cup final, you know, and that that was it, you know, because. I think uh, before the match, there'd been lots of uh, interviews with Malcolm McDonald saying what he was going to do to Liverpool. He to was fair. giving it all the north and south, wasn't it? He really he was. was. And I think Phil Thompson, he says in his after-show speeches now that all the all that Bill Shankly did is put his interviews <laughs> up on the wall. <laughs> and then Tommy Smith thought, right, we'll have him, you know. And uh, I think he only had one shot in the match. Yeah. And that was why, yeah. you know. I don't know if anybody's hearing the echo coming from you, Pete, but there's uh, quite a lot of echo. F Am I the only person hearing this, echo-wise? Is, is it sounding okay for you, Tim? Yeah, it's all right. It just There's no microphone, okay. so, you know, so uh, uh, okay. the sound quality's not great, but, you know, it's, it's, sure. it's, it's fine. Okay. Um, what I was going to ask, because when I looked at the footage of this, the first thing um, I thought about was that the crowd were just... It felt like a Liverpool home game to a certain extent. David was, Coleman, he almost has to shout to be heard over the crowd. Yes, you're absolutely he? right. And yeah. it's one of those classic um, old school crowds which start chanting the old, we shall not, we shall not be moved. <laughs> he was singing it. We Pete was there singing not, it. Wish. Of course you were. Because yeah, that yeah. was the chant of the 70s, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And also, if you listen to you Never Walk Alone, it's something like a hymn. It's very slow. Mm -hmm. It's not like it is nowadays where it's it's too fast. Everyone thinks it's too fast now, but no one can slow it down. But in those days, it was like, it was the choir. It was the cop choir. And, you know, um, we all learned from this. This was a, a vinyl that came out in early 70s. So everyone... Everyone got this cop choir album bought for them, so we like we could learn all the songs and how they were sung, you know. So yeah, the, the atmosphere was brilliant, and I think on the day I was surprised, even though you know I could still, I went down with uh, a few mates and me and my uncle was on the same coach, uh, and we were surprised at how many Liverpool fans there were compared to Newcastle fans. Mm -hmm. It happened to us a few years later with Man United in '77. Where they outnumbered us, you know, but mm -hmm. on the on this day, seventy four, uh, Liverpool fans outnumbered Newcastle fans. It was it was unbelievable. How, how old were you at, at the time? I'd just become a teenager, I think. Yeah, I was about thirteen, maybe fourteen. You know. But so it was one of me. It was one of my first trip. Well, it was my first trip to Wembley. I was too young, or I couldn't get a ticket in seventy one, and then um, my dad was a season ticket holder, so we must have qualified for it. Used to do it on serial numbers on the season tickets. Uh, you went into a ballot and then with serial numbers that came out. So I must have got one and went down on a coach on the day. Um, and it was the, the atmosphere, it was a carnival atmosphere before the game. There was no real trouble between Liverpool and, uh, and Newcastle, no history of any trouble anyway. And it was a fantastic occasion. But we were, you know, we weren't expecting the performance. You know, we were just hoping to win the cup, of course. But the performance by the second half, you know, when uh, Liverpool, I mean, it should have been 4 0 because if you see the Lindsay yes. goal, which would be yes. classic yeah. Liverpool FA Cup final goal, it comes off the defender. It doesn't touch key <laughs> through ball, it comes off the defender and Lindsay smashes it in. And uh, that should have been 1 0, you know. The, the linos in those days were awful. They really <laughs> well, were. We, we forget how good they got. Yeah. You see, people forget all of this because you see this shot. You've got to see the footage to see this shot, not only on the faces of uh, Lindsay and I think Kevin Keegan go goes up to him and meets him on the, at the corner flag, but also the shock on the faces of the bench. You know, I felt really bad about, you know, in retrospect for yeah. Bill Shankly that this, his crowning moment. But you, you've, um, you've, got, you've got the two managers yeah, sitting next sitting next to each other. Yeah, in those days, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I don't ever remember that. I'm sitting no, right no. right next to each other. Was it yeah. something that they did spec? Because Joe Harvey, the Newcastle That's manager. FA yeah. Cup. Sorry, apologies. FA no, Cup. No. I don't think they did it in right. normal league games. No, no, no. Maybe no, no, no. it was just for the FA Cup. But uh, at one point where Liverpool scored the third, I think, 
I think Bob Paisley likes a cigar. <laughs> and can you imagine Jose Mourinho sitting next to the opposing manager next to him? Oh, yeah. He'd be poking him in the eye, you know. Yeah, yeah. It right, it, it, so that first goal was disallowed. What was the atmosphere like then? Do you remember? Yeah, it was a it was a fantastic atmosphere. Yeah, I mean both both sets of sports was very loud, but I think you know Liverpool. We always thought you know, on the day we had the better team. Um, you know, we'd beaten our bogey team at the time, it was Leicester City, and we'd beaten them. We'd drawn, I think, nil nil at Old Trafford, and then we beat them at, in the replay at Villa Park. You know, I couldn't go to that because I was at school the next day, so the parents wouldn't let me go. <laughs> but on the Saturday, because it was a Saturday FA Cup final, and one of my uncles was going, they allowed me to go, you know. And uh, but yeah, the atmosphere was great atmosphere, you know. But um, you're thinking with Lindsay being disallowed, you know, we thought, oh no, you know, it's going to be one of them days. But then... So it's um, amazing to think this is only the second time that Liverpool win the Cup. It's amazing, yeah. isn't it? You know, yeah. from... Because we remember all that great Liverpool that just seems to be winning everything all the time. And this yeah. is only the... Se- so at this point, Newcastle have many, many more Cup wins than, right, than, yeah. than, than Liverpool have, which is bizarre yeah. thinking, thinking about it that way. What did you yeah. think of Wembley when you got you got to the place? Because obviously, in, in in comparison with a with a league ground, Anfield and so on, yeah, there's a running track and that around the outside. You know, you, you're yeah. you're you're away from 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 the pitch. So, what did you think of of it? And do you remember where you were in the stadium? Yeah, um, I was behind, right behind the goal, uh, near the front, and I just remember being surprised by the uh, the appalling facilities, <laughs> even in those days. But you know the the toilets were overflowing. It was uh, you know, and obviously seeing the twin towers though it's a great spectacle. It's, it was magical seeing that. But as soon as you got into the ground, I was a bit disappointed with the infrastructure, you know, because uh, there were bench. I think there were benches where we were, or you know, and, uh, we were on the terrace, and there was uh, benches on the side. Uh, but with the terraces where there was like lines and. To be stewards come along, don't stand over that line, you know, which is you'd never get away with that in the cop, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it was all pretty official, but um, yeah, I just remember being um, surprised by by the toilet facilities. <laughs> <laughs> you don't forget that, you know, as a 13 year old, you don't forget that, uh, trust me, uh, particularly if you slide in it. But let's leave that to one side. So finally. Keegan gets a legitimate goal. What do you remember about that one, the first? Are you, uh, are you behind that goal or the other goal? Um, we, I was behind the other goal. because. Uh, so you're a long way away. The opposite end, yeah, mm. to where we were. So, yeah, um, it was, uh, we were behind Clements for the second half, you know. And, yeah, it was, you know, it's, it's a it's a long as you say it's a long way away. So yeah. You couldn't really go, you know. But obviously, looking at the footage of it, it's it's a fantastic goal, and you know it's famous for um, Coleman and his quote, wasn't it? You know, goals pay the rent. The famous uh, Coleman, <laughs> yeah. goals well, pay the rent. Yeah. Well, Egan gets his share, yeah. you know, something like that. It was <laughs> absolute classic, you know. Which you know we all. We all started mimicking in school and that. You always pay the rent. You've ever scored a goal like that was it. But in, in that, isn't that bizarre? Because you're there watching it live. Yeah. And the way that, that you then remember it and turn it into a narrative is with, yeah. the, with the commentary of David Coleman that you didn't hear live. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but there is a special feeling, though, when in those days there was, in any case, and I think there still is, of going to a football match live and then watching it on Match of the Day or whatever later on that evening. There is a special yeah. feeling of, actually, I was there, and this is what's about to come. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, you can see everything in a wide lens perspective because you've been there, you know what's happening. Yeah. It, it, there is, and also when people were, were quoting that in school, I didn't know what they were talking about because I, I'd been at the match, you know, but it's only years later mm. that you realise that it was from the commentary. And that. Mm-hmm. we we watched the, um, I think it was the big match the next day on the Sunday because we were at home in time for match of the day. And we watched the big match uh, on the Sunday and we just, we, just re- we just watched it and thought, oh my God, what a performance. And that would have been with Brian Moore. That wouldn't have been Coleman. You know, that would no, have been... that's right. Yeah, that's <laughs> yes. right. 
that would have been Brian Moore. And then the later on in the afternoon, we went down to the uh, homecoming. And a lot of a lot of reports mix up the homecoming uh, with the homecoming from seventy one, which I went to as well. Mm. Arsenal beat us in seventy one, but Shankly did his famous speech then, and people misquote that as seventy four. You know, I've told the players they play for you and you pay their wages, and that's from seventy one. And they get it mixed ah. up because they look they look on YouTube and think it's seventy four. That's right. seventy four um, homecoming. It uh, wasn't at St. George's Hall. It was just to the side of it, where the um, uh, the library and the museum are, you know, just to the side of St. George's Hall. So when you see the footage, you know that when he did that speech, it was St. George's Hall because the pillars are behind them. You know? mm. What does Shankly oh, mean to you? He was everything to me. You know, I've been brought up a Roman Catholic and uh, I rejected religion at an early age. Mm. I ran out of altar boy induction and the priest was upset and he went out, came out of the house and said, uh, this has never happened before. Your, your Peter ran out of altar boy induction. And he said, yeah, and we, you know, he heard that there was going to be a seven o'clock mass and he wasn't going to get up for that. And they, my parents supported me on that, even though my mum was like very religious. They thought, don't want to get up at seven in the morning, the dark uh, mornings, you know, so... So, and I'd also, um, when I made my first Holy Communion, I thought I'd feel different. I was built up to this feeling, but I didn't feel different at all. But I did feel different when I heard Bill Shankly. And that was the difference, you see. And he became, you know, he later became known as the Messiah, didn't he? But, you know, as uh, during that, that, that period, Shankly was my, he was my God, you know. he was, mm-hmm. And he always talked about, Anfield being the church and the cop with the choir and yeah. it was the religion and people ashes buried in the, in the goal mount. So it all fitted into that spiritualism and uh, religious background that I've been brought up on. But it wasn't Jesus who was saying all this. It was Bill <laughs> Shanky. That explains the a meek lot. are not going to inherit the world. The meek are not going to inherit the earth in Bill Shankly's world, are there? There's not a lot of meekness going going on there, is there? Uh, well, you know, I had the uh, pleasure to do a, a documentary on him called Nature's Fire, you know. So learned a lot more about him and we actually visited Glen Buck a few times and I've been back since to see his um where he was brought up, which was a mining village, one of ten kids, you know, very poor background, you know. And that Glen Buck produced so many professional mm. footballers, it's it's not it's untrue, you know. They've got they've brilliantly got a memorial there now to him. Um, to all the players, I think there's 50 professional footballers came from the village, you know, and football was the, their That's life. Amazing. That's all they knew. You know? That's amazing. Um, that number of people. There is a documentary or bits of a documentary, at least, that you can see on uh, YouTube with the reporter going around on the day that uh, Shankly's announced his retirement. Asking people oh, in Liverpool, you've seen that. It is a classic, actually, because uh, first of all, yeah, the reporter has to keep saying, "No, no, honestly, I'm not having you yeah, on." It's real. He yeah, has yeah. retired. Yeah. He has retired. How yeah. do you know that then? Who said that? He said it. Yeah. I was there at the press conference. <laughs> it goes on. And on. <laughs> Nobody can it's, believe it. Which I think. Belief, I'm not... Sorry, go. It would be like, just to use your analogy, in a, you know, maybe a, a much kind of more slapstick uh, way, maybe in a life of Brian way, uh, to use your analogy, it would be like, you know, what, how do you know Jesus has been crucified? Who said that? <laughs> Who, no, I don't believe it. No, God, no honestly, he has. <laughs> Yeah. Shut up, big nose. <laughs> well, you know, this is the kind of thing, isn't it? Um, yeah. But it it shows, first of all, and, you know, you've got in this little clip, you've got very young kids, you know, I'm talking yeah. about boys of maybe eight or nine or ten. They've never known anything too. else, have they? But yeah, they're in shock. Yeah, they're they've never known anything. They're in shock. Yeah. They're absolutely... And, uh, it, the hairstyles are absolutely fantastic. <laughs> the, uh, 1974 hairstyles, yes. and the feather cool. absolutely see, brilliant. Why? And it was Tony Wilson who was um, interviewing them, who later, he was from Guard Report. Oh, yes, of course. And he later went on to, to you know, Factory That's Records. Right. Yeah. Yes. And, um, 
and was instrumental in in the Manchester scene, a music scene. Really. Of course, of course, late great, late great. And as a journalist, he does, was does, actually does, a pioneer. Does Granada cover both? Does Granada? Sorry, sorry for this ignorance yeah. about the uh, the north. Uh, Granada is just the north, next Liverpool and Manchester. And so Granada is Liverpool and Manchester. Oh, yeah, yes, yeah, no whole that northwest. That must be hard from an yeah. editorial point of view. Because I remember well, he famously he famously wore a bruise scarf. Uh, I didn't see it because I went out to the match in 1978 when Liverpool played at Wembley, and he 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 uh, he, he presented the news with a bruise scarf like a mm-hmm. like in a um, tied round like a student, mm-hmm. you know, and he had this bruise scarf on. I thought that was funny. You know, a lot of people never forgive him for it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think it's funny, but I probably wouldn't have done it myself either. Digging Every deeper now- in, into the into the Shankly legend, as you did, you know, yeah. for, for documentaries, what conclusions do you, do you come up with about about just how he did it, what he yeah. was? In it. Just an inspirational leader in any walk of life. I think if he'd have gone into politics, he would have swept to power. You know, he'd have been, he said, you know, even in, when he was in the army, if he was cleaning the mess, he wanted it to be the best clean mess in the whole barracks. You know, that was it, you know. So it was this attention to detail when, of course, before Liverpool, uh, hadn't been very salubrious his career, you know, as a manager, you know, he'd been a, um, Carlisle, I think Workington, and he had problems at various places, and then ended up uh, uh, Huddersfield. Uh, and so the, he wasn't, you know, he, but Liverpool, were, he said, Liverpool was made for me, and I was made for Liverpool. He, I that think he like, needed that scope, and he needed something grandiose. He needed. Yeah. He, yeah. he needed an army to lead, didn't he? Yeah. It couldn't. Yeah. It couldn't just be work a day. Uh, yeah, you know, another northern mill town. It, it's got to be something special. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's just coincidental that, you know, there was Merseybeat at the time when he right. he arrived in 59. Within a few years, you had the Merseybeat explosion. And it was just perfect for Shankly because, you know, he was the centre of attention. The Beatles, you know, Liverpool was the centre of attention. And they, this praise for what the cop used to do, you know, it was uh, it needed a, a leader and Shankly was the leader. Mm-hmm. And people still sing songs in the pubs about him now, you know. Um, there's a there's a there's a a strange irony about what happens to him afterwards, is isn't there? Because yeah. you know his own decision, he retires. Yeah. He shocks everyone retiring. Yeah. Pretty early on, he finds my God. What am I going to do? It's a it, it's 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 a mistake, uh, and he's he's frozen out. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of people criticise this, but yeah. That is the absolute ruthlessness with which he built Liverpool Football Club, isn't it? You know, it's not your knee, son. It's Liverpool Football's club knee. You know, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, absolutely yeah. ruthless. I think and it was can... handled badly. I think it was handled badly. But you can clearly was, see yeah. from the results yeah. that it worked for Liverpool because they yeah. didn't fall down the Man United hole where no. Matt Busby's still around. And that's, that's there's a Liverpool... dilution of power. I think Liverpool directors had seen what had happened at United and the demise and the fact that Busby was always in the background. And I think they felt, you know, we don't want that at Anfield. But I think it could be handled better, you know. Um, and there were several occasions where, you know, he was tearing up for training, you know, and he realised, he think he'd, he'd always been threatening to resign every summer because of various things, you know, which he, he felt the uh, club weren't doing properly. And he didn't get on well with the directors. Even even when he won the cup in '65, he was in dispute with them, and the players were in dispute with the directors because they treated um, Wembley as a neutral ground, uh, so they wouldn't pay them a, a crowd bonus. And Shankly, he told Ron Yeats, "Go in and have a word with them," because he obviously Shankly wasn't getting a bonus either. And so they just won the cup, first time they'd ever won. It should be the players should be happy and. And the, uh, the uh, Liverpool FC said, we'll give you the bonus for um, Villa Park for the semi-final because it was over 50,000 because you got a bonus if it was over 50,000. But Wembley's a neutral ground, so that doesn't count. Here's the, here's the rule here in the, you know, in the, in the rule book. You know, and that's, so we obviously didn't like the directors, you know, and he mm. kept on saying, didn't he, there's a whole eternity, the fans, the players and the manager, mm. the directors are only there to sign the checks, you know. So I think when... 
I think it was must have been really hard for Paisley because he was the reluctant manager. But when Shanks turned up at Melwood for pre-season training, he had his kit on like he had when he was manager. Uh, and like, come on, boys, let's go, you know. And I've never seen Shank as a, as, a, as a George Costanza figure, but now no. I do. Remember that bit yeah. of George Costanza? He resigns. Uh, and then over the weekend, he thinks, that was a mistake. I shouldn't have resigned. <laughs> so he yeah. goes back on the Monday and, yeah. you, you didn't take that seriously, did you? You didn't think <laughs> I'd really resigned? Yeah, yeah. But when he's um, interviewed, there's a clip where he's saying, you know, what was it like? Uh, he said, oh, it was like going to the electric chair. Yeah. And he yeah. could see that was after he'd resigned, you know. He was probably having regrets then, but two weeks after, he's, he resigned on July the 12th, I think. And two weeks after, Paisley was appointed. I always remember my dad. My dad's still alive. He's in his 90s, you know. And um, I said to my dad, well, what's this? You know, what about Paisley? He said, oh, we'll do nothing. He hasn't got the personality of Shankly. <laughs> and I always remind him of that when he's trying to give me advice still. Because Paisley clearly couldn't have done what Shankly did. No. No he did, cause, But at that point where, you know, the machine has been created. Yeah. Paisley's brilliant, isn't he? I mean, it's, yeah. it, it, it's an extraordinary record. Yeah. And, but uh, no one could be Shankly. No, no. I think it was the it was that power of personality, you know, the fact that when he, he came to Anfield in 59 December and he said it was the biggest dump. You know, and he had to, and he started painting himself with all the ground staff, you mm. know, and started doing things. And he was like, he was a workaholic, obviously, you know. And but he, he tried to buy several players before he bought uh, the two that transformed Liverpool, St. John and Yeats. He tried to buy Jack John, and he and the, the board wouldn't give him the money, and he he, he resented that. He said because that made Leeds stronger, and mm. you know. And um, I think he tried to buy Ray Wilson as well, tried to buy Dennis Law as well. He, and uh, all these players that were rejected by... So he didn't like the directors because he thought they had no vision. And it was only until a player, um, um, someone from the Littlewoods organisation, it's the John Moore's organisation, um, a fella called Tom Sawyer. And Shankly got friendly with him and he said, come on, I need the money to buy these two players, St John and Yeats. And they transformed the club. You know? he, but he, he was he was very class conscious, wasn't he, Shankly? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah, relations yeah. with upstairs, and they're never going to be easy, are they? No, no. And that's what Glenn Buck was all about. I think Keir Hardy, when he was trying to start the uh, Labour Party, would, would would go to places like Glenn Buck, you know. And um, if anyone, the coal board said, if, if, if anyone's putting up these trade union leaders and that, they'd be immediately sacked, you know. So there was all there was an. There was Omerta in the village when yeah. people were staying there, you know, and they all, it's it, people in the village now still, so they all cooperated. So if someone was having a hard time, they'd give them food, you know, and it was, it was, you know, that was the background of some helping each other. And that's this philosophy of the team. That's why Liverpool didn't have those flamboyant players as such, yeah. you know. We nearly brought Fra Frank Worthington, uh, but we didn't have the George yeah. Best. I mean, Keegan was probably the nearest thing to that. But he was still a very hard working player, yeah. wasn't he? He covered more ground than anyone else. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he, he yeah, Frank Worthington. I'm trying to imagine Frank Worthington Worthington trying to trying to trying to fit into to Shankly's regime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, would have been interesting. It would have. <laughs> um, well, Liverpool for me were always very significantly a working class club. Um and most clubs have those working class roots but it's a different thing to maintain it over the seasons as it were the sort of transformation from second division that happened to uh, Liverpool from the beginning of Shankly's time to becoming a world beater although you were saying Tim earlier on that it's um, incredible that this was only their second FA Cup final given where yeah. they had come from 15 years yeah. before and also yeah. I think also, not insignificantly, the other background to the story, which is it's not just about playing the football. It is about representing the city as well. I think that counts for a lot and maybe makes people think that it's not a huge achievement. But to take the whole city or half of the city with you, that's a lot, mate. And and it still is the case today. You know, whereas, for example, Tottenham, 
your team, it's not the Tottenham that I remember from when I was a kid and the area is not the Tottenham that I remember. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's just, it changes. And I think that has something to do with why Tottenham's managers come and go and they don't have that connection with the, uh, the local community whatsoever. Whereas if you're on a slot or before that Jurgen Klopp, it's, crucial the identity of the club well, surely, and the, that, that, that's part of Klopp's success there isn't it he he just got the city he yeah. you know he, he understood and on the slot it seems the he, same yeah it seems he was, you know, this, he was this generation Shankly yeah and you know I was at Old Trafford um recently and I was saying hopefully you know uh, slot's going to be our Paisley you know this new generation of Paisley, and now it's yeah. too early to say that. Yeah. People say, don't be saying that. It's too, you know, but, you know, the way he goes about things, you know, Klopp is punching the air, coming up with grandiose statements. So Arnie Slot's just getting on with it, you know, and I think, you know, that's uh, from what we've seen so far, you know, it's been very impressive, you know. Going back to the city that's being represented, I mean, the early 60s and so on is Mersey beat, and you get the idea of a, of a, of a city like most of the country going through something of a boom. Yeah. When does that end in, in, in Liverpool? Cause I get the impression that it ended there earlier than elsewhere in the country because Liverpool yeah. was the port of the empire, you know, yeah. and, what, and when the country turns much more towards Europe. Towards Europe. Yeah. yeah so it was so, in the early seventies, I'd say that, you know, where big factories that have been built after the war, which would, uh, based on armaments and big general electric, English electric and places like that. Uh, were massive factories in Liverpool. They started to close down then or to make people redundant. The docks were being labour intensive, started to go to containerization. Yeah. So all these things affected it. And when, um, when I was studying economics a while back, it was the early 70s. That's when uh, it really started to kick in with, with redundancies. Not not so much as seventy uh, nine when obviously Thatcher yeah. came in, but this was the start of it. Full employment was 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 a thing of the past. Yeah. Redundancy started to happen, uh, and also in seventy four you had the three day week, didn't you? You know, and the miners' strike. Uh, even though it wasn't directly affecting Liverpool as such, it did have an effect because we had you know. Um, uh, we had uh, three days in school, I think. I can't, you know, mm -hmm. there was like, it was blackouts, wasn't it? And all sorts going on, you know. So, can you remember, even around this time, can you remember the, the feeling of a city in decline? Uh, no, but, you know, when you're at school, you don't realize, you don't, you don't appreciate that. But you can definitely know that the docks were moving towards from, from the traditional docks out to the deep water docks in Seaforth. Yeah. Um, and then you could, you know, watching the television, you know, there would seem to be a lot of disputes going on, you know. So, uh, yeah, you could you could feel as if the tide was going out, certainly on Liverpool, yeah. be, mainly because of the EU, you know. And um, I saw reports that you know uh, since that you know Southampton started to boom and other other uh, you know Hull and places like that started to boom as dock, docks. With Liverpool was the gateway to the empire. Yeah. And to the Americas, that was a thing of the past, you know. You know, a, a very good friend of mine um, is a Scouser. And he, he has the sort of academic perspective that both you and Tim seem to add to it. And he always told me that Liverpool was this magnific magnificent city. I mean, when I first started going up to Liverpool many years ago, I couldn't believe how cheap property was, for example. I had friends who were students who were living in these huge apartments, yeah. absolutely huge apartments. There were so many empty buildings, you know, real old, grandiose Victorian uh, buildings from the days of empire and enslavement even that had yeah. managed to um, almost had gone past their sell-by day and that there had been such an exodus from Liverpool since the the 50s, he was saying, or at least uh, yeah. that Liverpool had lost literally half of its population had left the city since the 1950s. Yeah. So arguably the beginning of the decline was before the early 70s. 
you know, there was a lot of obviously a lot of um, slum clearance in the fifties and sixties after the you know after the war, and a lot of um, places like Kirby, Highton, Halewood, places that you you know about now, but they were outside. They were they were villages. They were they were farmland. Skensdale is another one, you know, and uh, so people moved out. So they're still in the Merseyside conurbation. So Merseyside's like 1.8 million people, but Liverpool City lost. It went from 850 to 900,000 down to like 450,000. Yeah. So it did lose half its population during a 20 to 30 year period. You know? it, what, is, what it, is, is, it is remarkable, I think, that is, the, the great time of the club happens at the worst time for the city. Yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of people saw it as a release, of course, didn't they? Mm -hmm. You know, and, you know, <clears throat> both Liverpool and Everton. Um, Everton weren't doing too well in the 70s, but certainly in the 60s they were, and in the 80s they were, you know. So it was a big release for people, and people had this pride in the clubs and thought, well, at least we've got football, at least we're dominating English football, you know, and that was the uh, that was the escape, really, you know, and I think, but if you, if you look at the... You know, you look at it, um, in the 80s, there was big conflicts between the city council and, and Margaret Thatcher, you know, it was only, and there's, you know, there was lots of things going on. But um, at the time, the Labour Council were very important, I thought, you know, because I lived in the city and they were building houses for the people who used to live in tenement blocks, you know, and the, some of the houses they built are still there now. Absolutely magnificent, you know. So there's a lot of bad propaganda for uh, about Liverpool in the in the seventies and eighties, but militant um, militant tendency propaganda. Yeah, when, isn't you it, lived, yeah. when you lived here, there was you know, it was a a, a great time to be you know growing it's, up. It's always the way. It's always the way because you you buck the trend uh, of the official narrative that there's no such thing as society, for example, uh, that Mrs. Thatcher uh, famously said, or at least is attributed yeah. to her famously, no such thing as society. Well, actually, the experience of people in societies is very different from the experience yeah. of the well, It's the most basic truth of the us. human being, yeah. is that we are, we are yeah. social animals. It's the most sure. basic biological truth that we have. Yeah, do, do you know? You better, tell, uh, you better tell Musk because he's quoting Hayek at the moment. Yeah, all the yes. time, yeah, tell me I about it. Is, That's why yeah, I can't get on Twitter. Yeah, well, I'm I'm considering leaving it. You know, it's it's on my mind. I mean, right. no, anyway, you can't leave, you point. can't leave it to the. Uh, to the uh, right wing, can you? Indeed, indeed. Well, that's a good point. Um, yeah. There's one thing I was going to say very quickly because I do want to talk about your day job as well for reasons that will become apparent in a moment or two. But, um, do you know, just talk about that community. I think most football fans are envious of the community mm. that is Liverpool or Everton even, but yeah. that community that's linked to the club and the city in that way we're envious because we don't have it and it's something it to, still exists to the same extent yeah. even with the american ownership and all the rest of it is it still is the essence still there well it's still there I'm, I'm the vice chair of the spencer shankley so you know we're we're um you know we're having um to, you know all the time we're in dispute with the club over ticket prices and what and whatever you know and now it's it's spread to other Premier League clubs. West Ham are in touch with us. Aston Villa are in touch with us. How did you counter the Americans? You know, and and that was Hicks and Gillette that we were fighting yeah. against. And so there is still that. But you know, I call it the the twitching corpse of the uh, traditional football fan. You know, because mm -hmm. obviously the American owners want to go to dynamic pricing, don't they? Obviously, they want, obviously. They want, you see the. Yeah. Um, what's happened to Aston Villa at the Champions League prices, you know, yeah. it's an absolute disgrace. But, you know, you get half the crowd saying, oh, we can't, we can't uh, protest because that's going to affect the team. And, you know, we had all these debates back in the day with Hicks and Gillette. It was only what, there was net, out of 45,000 fans at the time, we only really ever had 5,000 on board. 10%, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. just over 10%. So 5,000 had joined a march. Or five thousand stay in the ground to protest after the game, you know. Uh, now you can't find anyone who didn't protest against Hicks and Gillette. 
<laughs> the well, sex game, uh, I was going to say that's uh, exactly what I was going to say. We were all there. <laughs> we were all there. Trust me. Um, but let's talk about music then. In that case, because we always, as you know, on the Brazilian shirt name podcast, yeah. uh, Pete, we always look at the sort of uh, the musical soundtrack of the game that we look at. So, fourth of May, nineteen seventy-four, Liverpool versus Newcastle at Wembley FA Cup final. Liverpool just, just one last three, word. If Shankly has to bow out, what a fantastic last goal brilliant. to bow out! Oh, on. brilliant! When, yeah. when, when, when Tommy what? Smith becomes Beckenbauer, you know that you're doing something right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was, it was just, an exaggeration, but sorry. Go on, Pete. Yeah, I think uh, C- Colwyn on the footage said, uh, "And you know, you guys have been undressed." Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yes, yes. <laughs> They've been completely stripped, he said as well. <laughs> no, he said undress first and he added because yeah. he thought that's a good line. <laughs> Let me just egg it, over egg it a bit. And they've been completely stripped. Newcastle yeah. are walking around stark bol- <laughs> naked. That would have been his next one. Well, that would have been my next one. <laughs> yeah. So, David, do you mean that Newcastle are walking around stark bol- <laughs> naked? <laughs> <laughs> um, but the chance of the day. Oh, the little anecdote I was going to give you. One of my favourite anecdotes for being with Liverpool fans is taking a train down from Manchester early on a Sunday morning. I can't remember which uh, cup final it was, but they're all going to Wembley. The train was absolutely packed. And when I say packed, everybody, or oh, more than half of the train was standing up. And they yeah. were standing up so respectfully of each other it was you could almost hear a pin drop people were so silent not silent and they were talking but they kept the volume down because they realized the situation it would just be a rowdy mess you'd be knackered by the time you got to it everybody stood up so respectfully of other people because it was an early morning train it always strikes me as you know very much that community thing that we were talking about but in the charts at number one, following the Eurovision Song Contest, is one of our own, if you're Swedish. <laughs> uh, so let's, let's talk about your thoughts on the charts first, Pete. Well, I've just looked through them and, um, you know, they're not, they're not great, are they? Obviously, it's pre-punk. Uh, but there is one that stood out. Is that uh, Terry Jacks, is it? Yes, Seasons in the Sun. Yeah. He got a, a terrace chant, didn't he? Yes, we had yes. joy, we had joy, we had yeah. Tottenham on the run. Indeed, yeah. <laughs> the, fun, the fun didn't last because the bastards run too fast, yes. That's it. That's it. Yeah, that's that's right. Right. Yeah. Every club was singing that way. Yeah. So they were adopting pop music, yeah. Um, yeah, so not not great. Even even uh, Bowie's track um, uh, was Rush released, I think. I mean, that, being out, that was out on Ziggy Stardust, wasn't it? Two years before. And... Uh, Reading up why they re released it because it was, um, yeah, they were upset that uh, he wasn't coming out with enough singles or enough or enough product, you know. So, even one of the superstars of the time is getting pressured by RCA Records, get some more stuff out, and even not, we'll release this, you know. And it was the only one of the only tracks that never got in the top 20, I think. I think that's what it says, you know. Tim, uh, any thoughts on the chart? Yeah, lots. I mean, I was eight coming up nine and all of this time when i was a kid there was nothing that got through to me at all nothing i just thought it was ridiculous and the first thing that really the life-changing thing for me was a couple of years later when jewelot pete beatles films are on british tv for the first time and yeah. i saw hard day's night summer of 76 and i want to be a beetle you know it just yeah. it just turned me over totally it changed my life yeah. really i've just because been to see that uh, the re re um, it's been uh, redone, and we went to a cinema in Liverpool to see that with all Beatles aficionados and the ca- people who run the cavern and the Beatles story and all that. That's been it, a, yeah. After each, night. each track, it's a brilliant film, and it, it's you could a fabulous see, film. And I was I was next to, I was next to Frida, who was the uh, she did their fan club, and she said this is when they were happiest. Right, she said. You know, yeah. and you can see that in the film. The, the only I was, thing I like from this chart, I mean, the, 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 the Philly sound has come in big. Uh, I was going to say the Wombles. No, 
No, not that. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, even the, like the Diana and Marvin album, you know, um, it's, it's, there's a lot of kind of Philly type stuff on on, on that yeah. album. So they're in the charts with you or every, you or everything, which is lovely. Um, the Three Degrees, yeah, Year of, Year of Decision. It's a fucking brilliant song. Yeah, yeah. Year, Year of Decision, and I think underrated. Because uh, there was always a little political edge to some of the Philly stuff as well from, yeah, from Gamble and Half. And it, it's there in year, in year of Decision. Obviously, Stevie, you no, know, he's Mr. Know-It-All. Uh, yeah. which I th- uh, uh, Motherfucking Son of a Bitch. Or MFSB, as they refer to themselves. Yeah. Yeah, TSOP, yeah. the sound of, of, of Philadelphia. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Harold Melvin's Satisfaction Guarantee. There's, there's a lot of Philly stuff around. But... It's only since doing these things that it's really struck me that the music of this time has an absolute obsession with the 50s. It's as if at this time, it's as if the 60s never happened and everyone wants to go back to the 60s, to, yeah. to the 50s. You know, so you, there's your mud and rubettes. Actually, yeah. I think the rubettes, the harmonies are lovely. Um, I saw them do it once uh, and without the, 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 all the uh, production, just hear the harmonies on Sugar Bay. It's really nice, actually. It's really, there's a bit, of, there's, there's some doo wop in it, uh, but even like say Roy Wood. Now Roy Wood with the move, they are one of the movers and the shakers of the sixties. They are the Brummy Beatles, and you know even the, the Wizard thing. They just can't get out of the fifties. Everyone is obsessed with the fifties. You know, Rock and Roll Winter is, which is bizarrely in the top ten in May. Quite what's going on there, I, I don't know. But just that, that, and Bill Haley's in the charts with Rock Around the Clock. You well, know. well, I so was going to say, I, what, what, I, what was this obsession with the fifties? I'll explain. Um, the remember, this is the sort of a moment after the heights of glam rock. Glam rock. If you listen to many of those glam rockers from uh, T Rex to David it's Bowie 50s. at that period, yeah, exactly. But they're reinventing it, aren't they? Yeah. They're bringing it back. <laughs> The reason why this um, chart is so significant to me, as you've read my biography, Tim, you will know that the question mark was whether I went and saw Bill Haley in his comments when, when I was 12 years old or when I was 15 years old. From this chart, it tells me I was 15 years old because the reason Bill Haley in his comments is back in the charts at number 19 is because he's on tour of the UK. So I see him at the Mecca in Stevenage, which obviously suggests imme- immediately that he wasn't at the very top, 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 top of his uh, career. He had come down somewhat, but the Teddy Boys all came out for him. It was packed out, sold out and everything. I was there from about three o'clock in the afternoon just to look at the old tents. You know, me, I was born at the very end of the 1950s and didn't experience this Teddy Boy thing. I could see it coming back again in the 70s because off the back of the glam rock thing is a re-emergence of the original rockers if you like uh, some of the um, tunes in the charts I'm glad you picked up the rubettes because I think it's worth saying that as well as the old school people there were all of these new school people who were doing a kind of a reworking of rock and roll and putting it into the charts. But for me, actually, the best track in this entire chart is at number 40. In terms of a great song and a great performance, Pete, wouldn't you say The Way We Were was an absolutely amazing song that still resonates? I don't know what you think about Barbara Streisand as a singer, but I think this is a really elegant, elegant song. You'd have to sing it to me. I've forgotten about it. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't want me to sing no, it to no. you. But, yeah, but no, I mean, it's not. It's, you know, I don't know about Barbara Streisand. I mean, I, you know, I was, I was, you know, I don't, I don't know. It's, but memories. Like, but the song goes, memories like the corners of my mind. Yeah, it's, it's quite classic. Yeah, but very melancholy song, wasn't it? You know. Yes, it was a reflection yeah. on the days that had gone, the way we were. And uh, there are lots of takes on it, the way we wore, for example, nowadays. But it's about memories. It's about getting yeah. to a stage in your life when you're reflecting back. You've, you've got to be older to appreciate this song. We were, we were, we were all too young to appreciate oh, it. Oh, I hated time, it I at the time. No, yeah. I, 100%. I hated it at what? the time. I won't lie. There's one that leaves. Yeah. What about... Uh, but not Slade going into ballads. I love it. I, I, because they've gone, they've gone from the come on, feel the noise 
really well, I, stuff. I'd need to. Although, al- although Come On, Feel the Noise was my era, remember where they started from. You know, they started with Cause I Love You, which wasn't a ballad, but it was a much slower perspective to say. Slower, yeah. I it's think, my favourite of theirs. Yeah, it's a brilliant track. I think that they've still got enough cachet at this point to be able to do the ballads. Some people tried and it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Not, Noddy Older can sing anything, can't he? He's a, he's a, yeah, he's a great brilliant. singer. He's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. As, as there's you know, one from this I, chart. I was going to say, I always say, and I knew um, Joe Strummer, but I always say Joe Strummer has a lot to be grateful to Noddy Holder for because Noddy Holder was your UK Little Richard, the guy that could shout. I mean, Little Richard, he stood on the shoulders of the likes of Big Joe Turner, who could shout from the days when there was an amplification. But suddenly yeah. Noddy Holder does what all your you know singing teachers tell you not to do. He's shouting. But yeah, he's yeah, shouting yeah. so effectively it. that it's just, yeah, yeah, you're buzzing, you're buzzing, and yeah. all the kids are with it because that's how we <laughs> sing and all. He's got, he's got that R and B edge in his voice, I think. Noddy yeah, Holder, yeah. Uh, yes, I think it's great. Yes. There's one that just leaps out for me. It just takes me back to being an eight year old, uh, and it's the first week in the charts for Sparks, and this town ain't big enough for the both of us. And I'll tell you oh, why it leaps out for me because I can just remember <laughs> back in my living room, and top of the pops is on, and my dad just goes absolutely spare. I've only seen him that angry <laughs> twice. Once was, the other time was uh, the Sex Pistols with Bill Grundy. You know, what a fucking writer. He just wanted to put his foot through the TV screen, you know. But this, the, I, I don't know why it was with this. It just sent him through the edge. It might have been the fact that, was it Russell or Ron? The, I can't remember. The little Hitler moustache. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe that. And, you know. He had this look. On his face, like, yeah, I'm smiling. <laughs> I've got a Hitler moustache. What do you think of me now? Yeah. Yeah, a little bit of a... Uh, oh, it's, 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 it's great that Sparks are it's still playing, isn't it? They've been Amazing. Yeah, it's absolutely really? brilliant. Yeah, it's it's great. It's even greater that Oasis are still playing. Yeah. <laughs> and, of course, of course, Pete, um, famously... According to Oasis, the farm, your group, inspired them. Well, amongst other I've things. I've never seen that. I've seen that. I've oh, seen yeah. that. Well, at least that they loved you lot. Yeah, until they did the first interview and they slagged us off. <laughs> <laughs> and we said, uh, the problem with the farm is they think they're the Beatles, but they're just a bunch of chances. <laughs> We didn't know they had an obsession with the Beatles at the time. Of course, of course. So we went down to a club in Liverpool to see them when they were playing in front of 300 people. And we sent over a photograph of us, the farm, with the beat from the Beatles with Love On. And that was a reference to Tony Wilson's concert in support of Liverpool City ah, Council. Yes. In the 1980s when he, yes. he did a big concert in Liverpool. Uh, the Fall did it, the Smiths did it, New Order did it. We thought they'll know that that's a peace offering. But they didn't. They thought we were after them. <laughs> so they wouldn't let us in the concert in the night time. But we did get in. And in the end, they apologised. We never said that. We never said yeah. that. And Alan McGee's has backed them up since then, saying, what? because they said in the interview, there was a post of the farm in Alan McGee's creation records office. And he said, why would I have a post of the farm? You weren't signed for us. Why would I have a post there? It's just being made up as a, as a story to, you know, uh, because it was at the early days of Oasis, you know, no one's seen the phenomenon that they've become, you know. And um, obviously we've seen the ticket demand recently. But mm. to me, it's not it's not to do with music now, it's just an event. Mm. You know? Yeah, I would agree with you. When uh, when I said to a younger um person yesterday, about the age of twenty-three or so, and I said, Have you succeeded in getting Oasis tickets? Uh, she said, it's my dad I feel sorry for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because it's the mums and dads that are trying yeah. to get the Indeed. Oasis tickets of uh, the kids nowadays. So. It's like people in the 19th century used to go to a hanging, wasn't it? Yeah. That's what it is, isn't it? <laughs> there, there are you know, they were great live when we saw them in 93, I think it was in the Lomax or 94. And then I went to see them at Main Road in 96, you know, the 
first big, really big concert, you know. Uh, and they are, they are, they are great live, you know. But I mean, I don't know where the demand's come from. It's like it's the same way with the Stone Roses when they reformed. There was massive demand for that, you know. Uh, the certain groups that can, you know, can achieve that, you know, it becomes more than the were pop, more than the popularity they were at the time, you know. It just becomes a phenomenon, you know. And uh, good luck to them, you know. There are a few people I'd rather discuss this with than than yourself, Pete. But I've always thought that the Oasis Beatle comparison is just absolute sacrilege. Yeah. It drives me yeah. mental. And for, for a couple of reasons. One is that the Beatles, the the intellectual curiosity of the Beatles yeah. is just amazing. The, the Beatles, it's a triumph for me of post-war social yeah. democracy. That yeah. you've got this is the the the, the they are from a class that have never been educated to this level before. And blimey, they're going to take, in their own way, they're going to take every advantage of this. So everything that's happening in the 60s, every intellectual current that's going on, they are clued into it. They are learning, developing. And the the vibe I've I've often got from Oasis is, uh, well, let, let, let's get zonked out on on, on on drugs while we're watching afternoon TV. There's, yeah. there's, it's, it's not the same. And the other no. thing that drives me mad about it is actually musically, because as you know, the Beatles would always refer to themselves, especially for the first half of the career, as an R&B band. So what's yeah. what we are? We're an R&B band. I mean, that they couldn't understand that people didn't pick a rubber soul for crying out loud. It's a joke, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, and there's none of that or very, very little of that. In, in in Oasis music. And I know Steve White, the Paul Weller's old drummer, yeah, yeah. His, his brother was with him. I think he did a stint, he did a stint with him. And he said yeah. that he lent Noel some like Stax records just to clue him up yeah. a little bit. And Noel yeah, had never yeah. heard of any of them. He just wasn't interested. He, just, he wasn't listening listen to Mop the Hoople. So I, I don't see the comparison. Yeah. I, I think they're a plodding. No, it's completely different. Yeah. I mean, as you say, the, you know, uh, black music to the Beatles was everything. Yeah. That's all they ever, we used to go on about, you know, with, it was Ray Charles, you know, Little Richard, Bobby Parker. That was it. That that that's what that, that was their currency, and it's so much so that in the area uh, sets in the cavern, it was mainly black music. Yeah. And that's why it was great that when when the be, Beatle made in America, Tamla Motown started covering some of their tracks, oh. didn't they? You know, and yeah. did, you know, uh, reciprocated. So yeah, I, don't, I can't see that the Beatles were pushing back boundaries. You know, there's no doubt about that. And they changed society. You know, they did change society. You know, I think people look to uh, political movements and say, what gave you, oh, it was the Beatles, you know. And they, they wouldn't place the segregated audiences in, yeah. in America. It was, yeah. they were transformational. There's no comparison. There's no comparison. Having said that, having said that, just what you said about uh, the R&B that was being played uh, or the sort of... Uh, um, Mersey Beat venues or the Beatles, yeah. you know, supports or whatever it might be. It happened like that, as you will remember, Pete, during the punk days. The the yeah. soundtrack to punk was actually reggae music when you yeah. went to the club, right. particularly at the beginning, because there weren't enough punk records. No punk records. There's only, yeah, there's only and handful, reggae records go on forever. You can fill all the space. Well, and and then some of the clubs were playing Steel Pulse, Clue Clubs, exactly. Clan, always exactly. playing. You know, um, or, or dub, yeah. as, as Don Letts did. Dub, if nothing else, go back yeah. to the old school of reggae from 1973, it would have been at this point, yeah. anyway, since. Um, well, Marley since had a, Marley had a any punky reggae party. Did. Yeah. I remember that album, the Exodus album. I remember that so well. When that came out, and we heard the words, the damned, the jam were there at the punky <laughs> reggae party. You yeah, can imagine yeah, yeah. how us lot felt. It was kind of like. It was an acknowledgement from Bob yeah. Marley that I know what's going on in London. I've been in exile here for a couple of years since I got yeah. shot in the shoulders. And I know you lot. I'm going to give you lot respect because when you went to the gigs, half of the or the majority of punk gigs, this is, the majority of the audience were punks, but there'd be a line of dreads along yeah. the side of the wall or whatever, just either, you know, smoking yeah. the weed or whatever they were doing, but engaging. And yeah. there was a cross-fertilisation, you know, as well, much as you what, had... Well, that's what White Man and Hammersmith Palais is about, isn't mm-hmm. it? You're absolutely right. One of your favourite records ever, you know? And that is what, you know, their version of Police and Thieves is about. It's yeah. because yeah, yeah. 
They didn't do it. They purposely didn't do it the Junior Mervyn way. Yeah. They did it in a way that made sense to us punks and the way that we danced to reggae, etc. But that cross fertilization has always been there. I don't have a problem with Oasis. Um, I do think you're absolutely right when you say it's like, you know, it's like a bucket list thing now. All those who claimed that they were at Nebworth and saw Oasis 40 years ago can now realise yeah. the, the you know, fiction that they composed all this time ago and see them for real and say, I was there kind of thing. But in terms of a musical um, development, I think they've done something remarkable. I think they've hyped it so well. It's like Dave Chappelle in comedy. He goes off for a few yeah. years and he comes yeah. back and he gets $50 million per episode, per yeah. episode on Netflix. Nobody's ever been paid anything like that before. He's earning much more money by going away for five years than he's ever earned. I'm not saying that Oasis didn't actually break up or anything, but the way that they've brought it back together and competed with Taylor Swift, for example. It was Taylor Swift, remember? And we thought nobody's ever going to be able to compete with Taylor Swift. But they're doing it. They would yeah. have done 10 nights at Wembley by the time this is done, which is what yeah. Taylor Swift did. I think for live music as well, it's it's a boost. I mean, we've noticed in the last few weeks our Spotify has gone up 10%. That's got to be down to that. It's mm. got to be because, you know, people go, oh, yeah. 90s, you know, and we've got new stuff coming out anyway. So, but you know, people are looking back at it as well, you know. And I think it'll have an effect on live music, you know, because obviously the big stars have been like Adele, Taylor Swift, solo female artists. Mm -hmm. And this is group coming back, and you know, they're, they're going to break box office records, I would have thought, you know. If, if there are two words, and those who make their living from music are quite entitled to disagree with me violently, but two words I don't think should ever go together. And the Beatles discovered this, stadium and rock. Yes. Well, stadium and gig in general. I fucking hate stadium gigs. Yes. Just, they're okay. horrible. But it's a different discipline. You're not supposed to like them the way you like an intimate gig in well, a club, it's, are it's you? A, it's a discipline called making money from selling it, to a match. You can look at it like that, or it I can do. be a discipline. Well, good for you. But if if you were fortunate enough, and I'm not getting into the politics of this, to have seen Michael Jackson when he came over for the Bad Tour, you kind of understood what you could do artistically with a stadium gig. I mean, it was amazing. Whatever you think of him otherwise, it was an amazing... No, a Love spectacle it. and yeah. same as the rolling stones in a different way in a different way because i saw the rolling stones play at the stadium at ulevi in gothenburg before i saw michael jackson come over and i saw michael jackson first of all at the park de france in paris and then at wembley over here as well and uh, what the rolling stones did wasn't so much oh the spectacle but although mick jagger showed himself off as a front man and ran from one side of the stage like footballers run from one side of the pitch to the you know to the next side of the pitch and they keep running up and down up and down up and down he was like that but the real spectacle of the rolling stones is this is an event it's, it's an event yeah mm. this is an opportunity to see us live we come with a lot of heavy baggage musicians and we're so on a level now that we have to do it this way and I'm not that's, that's, what, that's what split the Beatles up as uh, yeah. the fellow, the Peter Jackson. Was that a you know, mistake? They, was that a mistake? Well, this is what Pete Jackson says, you know, about going all over those get back tapes. That they're obviously, you know, as four lads, when you grow up, you grow in different directions and there's clearly tensions there. But he says they they could have been worked out for a while at least. But their problem was they didn't have anywhere to go. Because they want to get back, they want to get back to doing a live gig in front of a live audience. Yeah. They've got nowhere. They've got nowhere to go. They've done the stadiums. They've seen that that's awful. It's a terrible yeah. thing. They don't want to do it. But they're yeah. so big that there's nowhere where they can play yeah. that's going to satisfy the millions who are going to see them. And that that's mm. is essentially why, what 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 brought the band to an end. Um, which I, I think is a really really, really good documentary. That was get back. It was absolutely. Fantastic. I, I've watched it all four times now. You know, because it's just basically four Liverpool lads still enjoying themselves when they're playing. Yeah. You know, forget all the baggage and all the arguments yeah. and lawyers coming in and publishers coming in. At the end of the day, when they're on that roof 
and the playing, it's just, it's magic. It, you know? It's exactly what we're talking about with football as well. All of the forces that have that have come to transform this thing into part of the global entertainment complex, yeah. at the end of the day, there's still an essence there that keeps yeah. us that keeps us hanging on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, well done for putting it like that. And you would agree as well, I'm sure, that the World Cup is a different spectacle from the FA Cup. We've been talking about the FA Cup uh, today, and it's a spectacle of its own, the magic of the FA Cup, etc. We know, it meant, don't we? It meant so much in them days. It, it did. did. And I was just telling my daughter, I was telling my daughter just about an hour before we started speaking, I was saying, look, we were comparing American football and the uh, razzmatazz of the halftime show that Kendrick Lamar is going to be the Super Bowl halftime appearance this time around. I said, for us in the FA Cup, can you imagine what it felt for my generation when the, the Royal Marines brass band came? <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, didn't Bruce Forsyth come on one? He came Ooh. on didn't he, for, before one of the Liverpool um, Cup finals. I can't remember if it was this one or or the 71, but I think Bruce Forsyth was, was on and Liverpool fans were singing, nice one, Brucey, nice one, son. You, know, went down well, you, know. you, you used to get a sing-along with Ed Stewpot Stewart as well. <laughs> but dear, but dear, pro dear. probably not this day yeah. because now Ed Stewpot Stewart is, was a big Everton fan. Yeah. Now the problem is the, the, the tannoy, the sound system at Wembley is so loud, you oh, can't get horrible. singing over it. It's horrible. Yeah. You know, it's horrible. You know, and, it's and, 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 and as I said to... Um, my daughter, I said, um, you know, we do things slightly different over here that the halftime entertainment, bring on a full band to play on for 15 minutes during halftime wouldn't work for no. us. No, not for us. <laughs> it wouldn't work for us. Anyway, um, to bring Ken Kendrick Lamar, we've got to bring this to uh, uh, an end, this fascinating conversation. I do yeah. love the way that we managed to weave in all the social context of all Liverpool human life and the here. people of yeah. Liverpool, everything that we've talked about, and some music wise and otherwise. Uh, you're amazing, Pete. It's an absolute pleasure. Uh, it's been a pleasure. That is. Honestly, I mean, thanks for having me on. You know. You're a historian as much as anything. You mentioned that you'd been studying e economy, um, but or economics, sorry. But um, no, I did that. I, I did that uh, um, um, college. You know, I did uh, so. I studied Milton Friedman and Hayek and all that. So when Musk's quoting them, I know mm -hmm. that they were cranks. Everyone knows yes. they were cranks. You know, and, yes. and Thatcher based the whole policies on, and it was a disaster. As we see I've, 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 sorry, I've, I've got to share this with you. Uh, Morris Saki. Morris Saki was Thatcher's advertising guru. Yeah. They yeah. were very close. They were good mates. Charles and, and Morris. Um, that's it. Yeah. And uh, he's the one who had the last lunch with Thatcher. When yeah. Thatcher can kind of confess it to him, it was all, it was all a waste of time. Because yeah. she'd imagined a world yeah. where of like, a thousand small businesses all fighting and, and, and she down. creates creates a world dominated by Musk and corporations. Yeah, and yeah. Saki, to give him his credit, because Thatcher obviously never didn't have the moral courage to share this with the world, you know, no. but no, no. Saki has done, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he, he, he wrote a really interesting article earlier on this year. Uh, and uh, he says that Mrs. Thatcher was concerned to hear that the end result of competition is the end of competition. Yeah. It's perfect. It's All perfect for the, for, the, for the world that we've got where mm. Elon Musk owns the global talking shop. You know, yeah, it's yeah. absolutely perfect for, for the modern world. So but at least Saki has come out more. the other side and said, you know what? It didn't work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sachi and Sachi are now agents, believe it or not, uh, professional agents amongst other things they've still got charles actually still got his gallery etc but uh, whereas they were an advertising agency during um yeah. mrs thatcher's day then now also a an asian uh, agent to the likes of gary lineker i'm pretty sure but certainly some oh, yeah. football yeah. agency and stuff like that as well so time well, moves if, on if, if they want to sponsor our show we'll take it <laughs> <laughs> it's not that now kind of a show now that he's seen the light <laughs> it's not that kind of a show tim but thank you for that suggestion and <laughs> yeah. um, pete hooton of the farm thank you once again for joining us thanks a lot it's been a pleasure and it's always great talking to you and it's always great talking about shanky <laughs>